it's this idea that under certain conditions of retrieval, the memory goes back into a state where it can be modified. So we refer to this as the active state, or you can think of it as the memory being in edit mode. And while it's in that state, new information can be incorporated into that memory. And that's essentially the process that we're trying to tap into from the perspective of both trauma memories, but also for memories underlying addiction as well. I'm Aran Jor, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Dr. Amy Milton is an associate professor in behavioral neuroscience at the University of Cambridge and a Ferreros Willits Fellow in Neuroscience at Downing College, Cambridge. Her research focuses on understanding how memories persist and become updated in the brain, with the aim of using this knowledge to develop new forms of treatment for mental health disorders based on maladaptive emotional memories. She's trying to understand the conditions under which emotional memories become unstable, particularly those contributing to post-traumatic stress disorder and drug addiction. We talked in the middle of April, 2022. When I heard about Amy's research and watched her TED talk about editing memories, I thought this was something out of eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. It's not often that you encounter treatment with such transformative results and such promise, and at the same time, such a scary potential. Despite her very technical subject, Amy was easy to talk to, and I appreciated the care she took in explaining her research and its implications to a general audience. We talked about how, from a very early age, she was fascinated with the gap between what people intended to do and what they ended up doing, growing up with parents who were smokers. Editing memories and how new information can be incorporated and the memories themselves disrupted. We talk about studying addiction and the connection between addiction and memory and how disrupting certain memories can prevent relapse. Different types of memories, implicit memories and explicit memories, episodic memories, emotional memories, habits. And what does the smell of baking bread have to do with memory's role in addiction? What can we do to fight addiction? The role of memories in phobias and PTSD exposure therapy, uh, and how it can get better with memory modification. The use of psychedelics in therapy and in addiction, and how uh, understanding the memory component of that could help us understand potentially psychedelics better. Virtual reality exposure, and the ethical considerations of modifying someone's memory whether it be through overuse, abuse, or a tyranny, where individual rights are not a consideration. I loved getting a taste of the complexity of the human memory system and how it can be disrupted or deeply affected in ways that can significantly improve our lives. And I believe thinking about these ethical implications of of this new capabilities is, is really important. This is one of a dozen or so weekly conversations we already have lined up for you with thinkers, designers, makers, authors, entrepreneurs, and investors who are working to change our world for the better. So follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app or head over to remakepod.org to subscribe. And now let's jump right in with Dr. Amy Milton. Right. I'm sitting here with Dr. Amy Milton. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And so for a while, I I had this like regular COVID check-in that I started every conversation with. And you've listened to a couple of episodes, you know this. And I feel like the world is always changing. COVID is in most places waning down. And then there's wars and the news is all over the place. So I'm replacing the question you get my new question, which is, 
What's it like to be you these days? <laughs> That's a good question. In the UK, where I'm based, we are gradually returning to normal. A lot of the COVID restrictions are gone now, although the university has been slower to relieve those than the government have. We're very cautious at the university, so we're making a gradual transition back to normality. Yeah, I mean, the world is a concerning place right now, right? I really feel for everybody who's affected by the war in Ukraine. And you know, we're exploring at the university, the university more generally, ways in which we can support people who are being displaced. The university's got a lot of work going on behind the scenes to see if there's any support that we can give. Yeah, so it's more normal in some ways than it has been, but I'm aware that the world is not normal anymore. And that so there's a bit more of a disconnect, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really interesting how everything is interconnected. I work at a co-working space here near Tel Aviv. And we have in the same open floor kind of office, people who escaped from Ukraine and came to work, who were employed for an Israeli startup. So they came here to work here. And people from Russia who also had done the same thing. People like working side by side, running away from for diff very different reasons, but also both having real hardship. So it, as a way into the conversation, our, our listeners already know this question. It keeps repeating, but I keep yielding interesting results. I like to ask our guests, what's something you learned or discovered in childhood or early in life that still guides or drives you today? That's a really good question. I think something that occurred to me fairly young, actually, I've always been really interested in what we intend to do and what we actually do. And I can see in everyday life, people intend to do one thing and they end up doing something else. Mm. And I think that's always really fascinated me. And it's only as I've gotten older and I've you know, studied more that I've realized the impact that the environment has on our behavior. So we may go you know, in with the best of intentions, but the environment that we end up in mm. ends up driving a lot of that behavior in ways that we're not consciously aware of. Mm. And I can't remember how old I was when that first occurred to me that there was this disconnect between what we intend to do and what we actually do. But since spotting that, I've always been really intrigued by it. Huh. And so how, how did that kind of manifest in early life when you pursued that question? Give me some examples of that. Yeah, so I suppose it was things like both of my parents were smokers, for example, mm. and repeated quit attempts, but it never happened. There was always something that ended up le leading to a relapse. I mean, this is not an uncommon story for, for people who are addicted. Mm. So it was things like that. The intention was there and the intention was good. Mm. But then when it came to it, it, it just wasn't followed through on. And it wasn't necessarily because of anything wrong with my parents. You know, it was just there was clearly something more powerful happening under the surface. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I, can, I remember this brings, up, brings uh, up a memory and we're going to be talking a lot about memories. Apparently, when I was four or five years old, I heard about the dangers of smoking and both my parents were smokers. Mm -hmm. And I just came to my dad and I said, Until you stop smoking, I will never hug you. I won't let you. I won't let you hug me. Mm -hmm. And it was so shocking to him that I came in. I was like, no, that he stopped smoking that day. Mm -hmm. And then my mother took longer. Actually, me and my sister started a campaign of uh, throwing away whenever we found a cigarette box, we threw it away. Like, and so is this mm -hmm. an example of the environment acting on you? And and today, as mm -hmm. far as far as I know, they're not smoking anymore. So. With that fascination, how do we get to memory? Why study memory? And what was the path to focus on that? Yeah, so it does. I mean, it seems like it's very separate, doesn't it? But actually, it's very connected. So I've always been interested, as I said, in these kind of unconscious influences on our behavior. And one way that manifests is compulsive behavior, which I think is probably the most extreme form of this, right? You really intend not to do something and yet you have this urge that you must do. I had always been interested in learning and memory as well from my undergraduate years. I was just fascinated by this idea that tiny changes that you can't see happening in brain cells can lead to big changes in behavior as well. And I was really fortunate for my PhD 
to be based in Cambridge and I did my PhD with Barry Everett who is an addiction researcher, very famous addiction researcher. But Barry also knew that I was interested in learning and memory. So came with this idea of what if we try and combine these things? What if we try to see whether the influence that the environment has on addictive behaviour could be targeted by some of these memory disruption techniques? Mm. So I'll unpack that a little bit. We know that in addiction, relapse is a major problem. As we were just talking about, relapse is very common in people who have managed to quit drugs for a period of time and maintain abstinence. And relapse can be a problem for years, even decades after somebody has quit. A very kind of potent precipitator of relapse is being around people, places, paraphernalia that are associated with the drug use. So finding the cigarette box or being with people that you would normally drink with and alcoholism or places where you would normally take the drug. And these are a type of memory. So we refer to them, I guess, as emotional memories. So it's this kind of associative emotional memory mm. that influences behavior in this really under the radar, implicit way. And so that's sort of one aspect that's driving relapse behavior and it is a memory that could potentially be targeted for disruption and then gave me a very nice PhD project to look at whether it was possible to disrupt these memories that underlie cocaine seeking behavior in a rodent model Mm. to disrupt those memories and then reduce relapse like behavior in the rats going forward. Yeah so talk to me about so there's this intersection that I'm not sure I quite understand between Addiction, habit, which in my mind is different from memory, and then memory. And so are we talking mm-hmm. about I'm, an, I'm addicted because I have some traumatic memory that makes me compensate for it with addiction? Or is the habit itself a form of memory? Help me understand that better. Yeah, of course. So the habit in is itself a memory. And I think the way to think about it, when we talk about memory conversationally, we're normally referring to a really specific type of memory. So it's remembering what you did last weekend or what you did on your last birthday. It's that kind of what, where and when, what happened, who was there, but it's not the only type of memory. So Larry Squire, back in the 80s, I think, put together this really nice taxonomy of memory, he refers to it. So he separated out implicit memories and explicit memories. Now, explicit memories are the ones that you're consciously aware of the content Mm. and you can pass those memories on in words. So that includes the event memories that we normally talk about. So I could ask you what you did last weekend. You could tell me I could have an image in my head, but fact-based memories would also count as that. So remembering facts, you know, what's the capital of France and what's five times 15 or, or whatever. Right. Yeah, you know, those kind of fact-based memories would also count as explicit memories. There's also though this other branch of memory, which is the implicit memory. And this is where you don't have necessarily have conscious awareness of what the content of the memory is, although you may know that memory exists. Mm. And so the classic example that's given for implicit memories is actually a different type of implicit memory referred to as procedural memory. So this is things like riding a bike. So it's not like you can teach someone to ride a bike by giving them a list of instructions. It's that practice, sort of unconscious acquisition of knowing how you hold yourself to balance, what muscles you contract at the same time, what speed do you need to pedal at so the bike is stable and and that sort of thing. Mm. So the memory is there. It's clearly learned because you can't do it unless you've practiced it. But you don't have conscious access to the content of that memory, even if you know that memory exists. Those kind of implicit memories, those ones are procedural memories, but there are also these emotional memories as well. Mm. And so we learn over time that particular cues or context within the environment are associated with particular outcomes. So I always think a really nice example of this is the smell of baking bread. Mm. The smell of baking bread is amazing. We all love it. But there's actually nothing intrinsically rewarding about the smell of baking bread. It is just a smell. There's no reason why we should like it unless it has been associated with the opportunity to eat delicious fresh bread that's just come out of the oven. Yeah. 
So that in itself is an emotional memory. It works for other things as well, cakes or steak, if you're so inclined, whatever it is. Yeah. But there's no reason why that in itself should be rewarding, but it is. Mm. But there's also this emotional element as well, that actually this becomes a good thing in its own right because it has been paired with something else that's rewarding. Mm. And that's fine if you're dealing with baking bread. It's, it, you know, it works the other way as well. So aversive memories work very similarly. Mm. Like, I'm going to avoid this thing because that's been bad in the past. Yeah. But in addiction, these drug-associated cues tap into the same system. And because drug reinforcers are pharmacologically enhancing these mechanisms mm. within the brain, they become really powerful drivers of behavior and how that links to habits habitual behavior is this association of a stimulus with a response so we can act in the goal directed way so we can act because we want a certain outcome i i go into the kitchen because i smell the bread baking and i want to eat the bread so i go in there but if i just had you know a massive lunch maybe i don't want to eat the bread so i don't go in there but when behavior starts to become habitual it doesn't matter what the outcome is because it's not in that memory it's just the stimulus is there so you do you make the response mm. so i might have just eaten lunch but i walk into the kitchen anyway and i eat the bread so that's where the link to habits comes in and mm. habits are in themselves a type of memory which you know, ultimately might provide some scope for targeting disruption as well so i could have the habit of mindlessly eating whenever there's fresh bread on the counter when i go by there could be a habit for like me to pick up and eat it there can also be a non-habitual Oh, I smell that there's bread. Let me make up my mind about whether I want some bread. I could go and get the bread. That's wonderful. What's the difference between an action we take for its own sake in the moment and it's like a decision that we made versus a habit? What makes it into, I'm trying, trying to get into the brain. What's the difference between a habit and a non-habit when the action is the same? Hmm, that's a really good question. So it turns out experimentally, you have to design very clever behavioral experiments to tease these things apart because the action, as you say, is the same. And the reason underlying it can be completely different. In the brain itself, though, we know that these memories underlying these behaviors depend on different structures. There's two major regions that are particularly important for this sort of move from goal-directed to habitual behavior. So when we're looking at goal-directed behavior, this depends on a region that is often referred to as the nucleus accumbens. It receives information about your motivational state. It receives information about the cues in the environment, and it can then influence the actions that you take by acting on this region known as the dorsal striatum. So in the case of making the decision to eat the bread, you've got your motivational state, maybe you're hungry, you can smell the bread. So actually you've got these cues which are driving that behavior and then you can make the decision. But for the case of habits, this circuitry seems to change. So rather than going through the nucleus accumbens, this information isn't going directly from regions like the amygdala and the hypothalamus to the accumbens. Instead, it's shifting to different parts of the amygdala that are directly driving the action selection in the dorsal striatum. So we're not getting that integration of motivational state and cues in the same way anymore. We're just getting cues drive behavior, mm -hmm. which in many instances is very adaptive. You know, you want, habits are very quick. They don't require the same kind of cognitive load of making the decision. A lot of habits, we, we think about habitual behavior in terms of like you're driving a car and behavior becoming automatic. You just execute certain action sequences. When you see certain things, you see the red light, you know exactly what you need to do in order to brake without stalling the car. That's all very adaptive. But the problem that you get in addiction is one additional layer on that, and that's the development of compulsive habits. So mm. most of us can control our habits under certain conditions. But if we lose that ability, to suppress those habits when they're no longer helpful, that's when you start to get into compulsive behavior. And that's the problem that you get in addiction. Mm. So 
I, I want to move in a moment to this area of maladaptive memories and the stuff that you do today. But before that, I, I want to pause maybe and get some tips from you that are more general and, and maybe practicable as individuals. So the first question that comes to mind for me is with so many tech platforms out there actually employing neuroscientists and employing specialists to make their platforms more addictive. And given that we sometimes have to interact with those platforms because our friends are there and our work is there, is there something that we can do to not form habits that we don't want, to keep the agency of in the moment deciding, do I want to open Facebook or do I not want to open Facebook? Okay. Yeah. No, I have the same thing as well. Do I really want to open Facebook right now? Am I just doing it because I see the, the little logo? The best thing that you can do is to be mindful as to why you are doing this. So mm. what is the purpose of interacting with you know, Facebook right now? And mm. it's fine to just want to check in and see how people are doing, right? So it's that's fine. But being mindful of why am I doing this. And you can also set time limits and that sort of thing. So you don't end up caught up in this, I'll check in for two minutes and then an hour's gone by. So you can put in steps to make you check your behavior manually, if you like. Mm. Also putting it out of the way. So don't have it on the first screen you come to, bury it away in a folder or put it somewhere where you've really got to make the effort to get to it. And then you're far less likely to encounter the queue that's going to make you open the app and, and have a look at what's on there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm obsessed with that kind of preventing myself from getting addicted. I don't actually get addicted to a lot of things, but social media, for sure, that's my addiction. And I actually have two phones. One that's my kind of everyday phone does not have any social media on it. And then I have a separate phone for work because I do need social media. It, it has only social media. It has everything but it has a blocker. You know, it only works during work hours. It actually mm -hmm. doesn't work in mornings and evenings. And I also have a safe in my house where I actually lock the phones when I don't <laughs> want to be around them and hide the key somewhere else. So, so these are all environmental. And then mm -hmm. you, you said just merely connecting with your motivation in the moment helps you rewrite that habit or how, how does that work? Yeah, so I guess it's checking in as to why you're doing it. So it's being mindful of, of your behavior because mm. habits are automatic. And if you're checking in, why am I doing this right now? What you know, What is it that's driving this? It may be that you can identify something else that would be a better solution than you know, checking Facebook. Maybe you're feeling a bit lonely, in which case, Go and find, go and find your partner and go and have a chat with them mm. instead, or you know, find something else that fulfills that need. But being mindful is hard because it involves cognitive resources. We have to pay attention to what we're doing. And this is the, the sneaky thing about habits that I do find so fascinating is that it's kind of slipping in under the radar. You find yourself doing it and then you have to stop yourself and think, why am I doing this? Which is you know, one of the reasons why I'm so interested in whether it's possible to try and target these memories directly. I, I'm wondering because I'm, I'm always curious about people who are researching something that fundamental, how it affects their the way they live their lives. Because I think there's a lot of kind of probably wisdom that we can glean from that. So I'd love to hear, how does your understanding of memory, trauma, addiction, and all that's involved, how does it change the way you live, the way you teach, the way you parent, any, anything that kind of, that it helped you do better? That's a really good question. So what do I do differently? We often have a bit of a joke in the department that you, know, you study the things that you're deficient in, right? So my memory mm. is actually appallingly bad. My explicit memory is dreadful. My implicit memory, mm. I think, is pretty good. So what do I do differently? It's perhaps easiest to answer in terms of teaching. One thing that I always try to emphasize to my students is that you want to be looking for links between things. It's much easier to remember information when it's part of a much bigger structure that you already have. So understanding underlying principles mm -hmm. and then hanging the detail off those principles is often a very good strategy. And if you've got a really bad memory for detail like I have, you can often work out 
what the details should be on the basis of those underlying principles. In terms of the rest of my life and parenting and so on, I'm very mindful of the behaviour. I'm not necessarily sure that I change it. So yeah. I'm interested to see how you know, how my sons re- respond to reward cues. So I always found it very funny that my eldest son would always walk directly into the kitchen when you know, we were cooking dinner, but my youngest son would go to the dining table, which actually, in terms of rodent models, mm. you can separate out as uh, two different behaviours, sign tracking, which is going to the queue itself, um, and the smell was driving one son, and goal tracking, which is where you go to the location where you're going to get the reward, which is what my younger son was doing. So yeah, so probably driving my husband to distraction by saying, look, <laughs> one son's <laughs> sign tracking, one son's goal tracking is probably the biggest impact it's, it's had. But I think what's really interesting about the effect that these memories and these cues have on behavior is that even being consciously aware of them, you still find yourself completely susceptible. So being aware of it mm. might make you question and be a bit more mindful but you're still affected if I walk into the coffee shop and I'm not intending to buy coffee but I can smell the coffee I'm probably going to cave in regardless of the fact that I know exactly which parts of my brain are being activated I know exactly how this behavior Mm. is being driven but I'm still probably going to be susceptible to it anyway yeah one, one memory that comes up is for years, my dentist told me to floss. I have to floss every day and that would not stick. I would try a day or two and then it would stop. And then the dentist told me it's very important to floss right before you brush your teeth. It's a much more effective brushing experience. And in fact, whenever you brush without flossing, it's... A, and that hooking it right before, so knowing exactly where in the sequence it's supposed to go, mm-hmm. suddenly I, no problem, kept flossing every day for, for years. So you talk a lot about maladaptive memories. It's, it's a big part of what you were researching. Help me understand what these are and what's their importance. Yeah, so the idea of maladaptive memories is really referring to these emotional memories that we were talking about before. And most emotional memories are adaptive. So it's evolved, this system has evolved so that we can, you know, find food, find water, find mates, you know, keep the species going. It's all very kind of evolutionary focused. So most of the time, these are adaptive memories. We can control them, you know, we control their expression when when we need to. But under certain conditions, these memories can lead to behaviours that become maladaptive. And this is thought to be the case in a number of mental health disorders. So it's probably best understood from the perspective of post-traumatic stress disorder, where I think it's quite easy to see that normal fearful situations within a certain level of stress are are fine. We can manage those and we learn to avoid those. And we can use that information going forward to avoid being in situations like that again. Mm. But under very severe trauma conditions and very stressful conditions, what you can get is a memory that is a, a fearful memory that has become overly strong and overly generalized. So this is no longer tied to a particular time and place. This becomes something that comes to dominate behavior when it's no longer appropriate. And so that's how we define a memory being maladaptive, that its influence on the individual is much greater than it should be. And it's Mm. stopping that individual from being able to live a normal life. Mm. And and you you talked about, and this, this was fascinating to me, you have these memories that are the results of great stress that are saved without their context, Mm -hmm. right? Without the what, why. So you can no longer necessarily even access it as an event memory fully, but the, but it drives you and it drives you in so many other contexts where that, that are not actually relevant or they're not actually helpful. Yeah. So we know a lot about the, we know a lot about the relationship between these different brain structures that are supporting memory. We talked about implicit and explicit audio declarative and non-declarative memories. And Mm. I might have implied that they were kind of siloed and the experience has to fit in one silo or another. 
but that's you know not necessarily true you can form an episodic memory you can form an emotional memory at the same time and most of the time these interact to some extent we do tend actually to remember events that have some emotional charge to them better than other events so Remembering what you did on your birthday is easier than remembering what you did on some you know, random day of the week, however many weeks ago. So if mm. there is some emotional component, we do tend to remember better. But what happens in uh, trauma memories is that all of the stress hormones that are circulating during a traumatic event have very different effects on these two different brain regions, the amygdala and the hippocampus. So the amygdala does extremely well with stress hormones. It enhances learning related mechanisms so that these memories form in a really strong way. But in the hippocampus, it has the opposite effect. So actually what it's doing there is impairing learning. Mm. So what you end up with is an imbalance between this really strong fear memory and the space and time and the control mechanisms associated with that fear memory. So Mm. This imbalance then means that your behavior is influenced in a way that you may not have conscious access to in contexts and by cues where it's generalized beyond the usefulness of that memory. So to give a kind of concrete example, if you're involved in a car accident and the car that hits you is red, you may find yourself being triggered by red objects in the environment. So you're walking down the street and you're having flashbacks because there's a red post box there, but you don't have, because you're not consciously aware that your trigger is the color red, you have no explanation of why this is being triggered at this point. And you very skilled clinicians, I'm not a clinician myself, but very skilled clinicians that I know spend a lot of time with their patients trying to work out what these triggers are, because it is a, a process of having to really work back and try and figure out when are these flashbacks occurring? When does the psychological distress occur? What are the common elements of those situations? And which of these might be triggers? So it's actually really difficult to do, but can be done by you know, interacting with a skilled therapist. You're listening to Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. If you're listening on a podcast app, you already know how to follow podcasts. So please follow this one. If you're listening in a browser, just go to remakepod.org to find links to all the major podcast players where you can follow our show. You, you mentioned accidents and I, I have uh, I have my own story and I, I'd love to uh, analyze that with you because I think it maybe has a lesson there. So this was the years ago. So oh, I think over 15 years ago, I was in my car driving pretty fast, but there was a, a long stretch of road ahead of me and there's a hill, right? So the cars ahead of me, which are far away, go over the hill, disappear. And I keep going at the same speed because there's no indication for me that something is changing. I get there, you know, over the hill and I see immediately that both cars have pressed the brakes massively at the same time. Time slows down. I remember looking at what's going to happen, looking at the car getting near, looking at my legs and saying, my legs are not going to make it. I like, I, I, I made the calculation that this is going to smash my legs most likely. And as I come closer, I suddenly notice that the cars are not fully lined up with it. There's two cars at both sides. They're not fully aligned with each other. There's a little bit of a gap. Somehow I managed to slip into that gap and get off onto the side of the road and nothing happened. So I'm in my car, breathing heavily, sweating. Time goes back to normal. And my heart is beating And I hear this voice in my head saying, if you don't get back on the road right now, you'll never drive again. Like right now is the time to go. So I forced myself to get back on the road and finish the drive. And 
I don't think I had any bad effects after that, actually. I think I, the next day, I mean, I could drive normally. And if anything, I'm like I'm a calmer driver now. But I, that, I, that, I had this really strong sense that, some, that that was a critical moment. Would you say that that was a, a correct sensation at that moment? That if I hadn't, you know, where, where potentially that could have been saved as a very traumatic thing? Or how do you interpret that story? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm so glad that you managed to avoid being seriously injured. Yeah. I think you're right. Getting back in the car, you know, so long as it was safe to do so, getting back in the car and getting on with it is you know, one of probably one of the best things that you could have done because essentially what you are doing there is you know, taking that learning experience and then effectively showing yourself actually it is safe to continue driving. You know, it's kind mm. of getting back on the horse, I suppose. You know, formally, we refer to this as kind of extinction learning. It's basically teaching of kind of the safe association. Um, so mm. you've learned that driving the car is potentially very risky, but actually what you're doing now is showing that the car, that you're driving the car is safe. But it's also worth commenting that actually the number of people who go through an event that would qualify for, for generating post-traumatic stress disorder is estimated to be somewhere between 70 to 90% of people like across the lifespan. Mm. But actually the prevalence of PTSD is much lower than that. So many people will experience traumatic events, but won't go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. The, the likelihood of developing PTSD varies depending on the type of trauma, particularly violent attacks and sexual violence tends to have much higher rates of PTSD following those kinds of incidents, natural disasters mm -hmm. much less so. But the fact is that most of us actually will go through something where we could develop PTSD, but we don't. So I think that's still a really open question for research. A lot of research in this area focuses on why do people develop PTSD following trauma but actually there is the inverse question which is why do a lot of people not and is there something mm. about being resilient to the trauma that actually could be useful therapeutically if we could identify what those protective factors are then maybe that's something that could also be incorporated into treatment or into prevention. So I would love to actually you know, maybe get to the basics of this. So, you, so you are actually engaging with erasing or changing, editing these maladaptive memories. And you talk about in your TED talk, you talk about edit mode. You get putting your memory in edit mode and then changing it. So, yeah, tell us what you do. What you've discovered. How does this work? And and what have you been able to to prove? So this all came out of work that was happening in NYU around 2000. Mm. And it was actually, I mean, these studies or this effect was first reported in the late 60s, but it, it didn't go anywhere because it didn't fit with kind of where neuroscience and psychology were at that point. The traditional view in neuroscience of how memory is made is that there are connections between different brain cells which are getting stronger or getting weaker following an experience. And this produces a memory trace, sometimes referred to as an engram, a network of brain cells that all talk to each other that represent that memory. Mm. And then if you give part of the memory back, you give a cue, uh, like a retrieval cue, this can then activate the entire memory trace again, and that memory is then recalled. Yeah, the original idea in neuroscience is that once these memory traces have been made, they're permanent. So you've got mm. you know, a window of a few hours where all of these changes are happening to allow the strengthening or weakening to occur. And then that's it. The memory is made. Now, psychology had known actually for a really long time that this is not how memory works. It's much more mm. modifiable than that. It's far more dynamic. But at that point, sort of in the late 60s, and then from mm. that point onwards, neuroscience became very focused on you know, this, this, this view that memory was stable it couldn't be updated. And what we're trying to figure out is how that happens at a molecular level. Mm. And so psychology kind of went off in a different direction and was looking at you know, Elizabeth Loftus's work, for example, on false memories and how memories get updated and edited and how they can be modified. But it wasn't looking at this kind of mechanistic neurobiological level. So there's a lot of mm. kind of psychological mechanism, but not looking at that in the brain. 
So then in 2000, with these studies from NYU, what this did was marry these two fields back together. So it was this finding that reminding, in this case, it was an animal that had been trained to associate a tone and a mild electric foot shock. So this is a procedure known as Pavlovian fear conditioning. Mm. Um, it's very robust, single trial learning in an animal. What they found was that if you remind the animal of the learning experience, so you present the cue, but no shock, just mm. once, that's all you need to do. And then you target the production of new protein specifically actually in the amygdala. So this is kind of taking this idea you're reminding, but you are targeting a really specific mechanism. So the production of new protein in the amygdala, which we know is really important for the storage of that emotional memory associating the cue and the shock. Mm. If you do that, when you go back and test those animals a day later, you find that they behave as if the memory was not there. And we know it's a combination of the reminder and the manipulation because if you just block protein production in the amygdala without giving the reminder, the behavior isn't affected. Mm. So it's this idea that under certain conditions of retrieval, the memory goes back into a state where it can be modified. So we refer to this as the active state, or you can think of it as the memory being in edit mode. And while it's in that state, new information can be incorporated into that memory. And that's essentially the process that we're trying to tap into from the perspective of both trauma memories, but also for memories underlying addiction as well. And in terms of the impact on humans, have, have we seen anything that, that could be pointed to as a, wow, this is a real transformation? What have we seen with, with humans? So in humans, it's much more challenging to do these studies because the kinds mm. of approaches that have been used in the animals, you know, with animal models, you can directly administer drugs to the brain, for example. So the protein synthesis blockers right. um, can be given directly to the brain. Obviously, you can't do that in humans. So the approaches in humans have taken sort of two major different routes to trying to affect the memory. So the first is pharmacological, and that's using a drug, a beta blocker known as propranolol. It's not a universally solid literature. It's not always the case that the effects are seen. I think there are good reasons for why that would be. But we can see from the work of Meryl Kint at the University of Amsterdam that if you take healthy participants, you know, Dutch undergraduate students who have undergone fear conditioning, in a very similar procedure to the rats, actually. So in this case, they're being shown pictures of spiders and they're getting a, an electric shock to the wrist. So mm. but otherwise, the procedure is, is basically the same. You can see that propranolol reduces the emotional impact of those memories. So the unconscious response of eye widening. So when you see a, fe a fearful stimulus, your eyes widen and you do this completely unconsciously. And that's mm. what they're using as their measure of, of fear. Mm. you can see that response is gone. So actually, the no. participants who have been reminded and had propranolol don't show that response anymore, but they do actually still have the event memory intact. So they know that spider was paired with shock, but they're mm. no longer afraid of it. And of course, they've got control conditions where you're giving placebo or you're not re-exposing individuals to the spider, and it's only in that combined condition that you see this effect. That's also been tried. I mentioned Alan Brunet at McGill. Um, so he has looked at this with patients, getting people to recount what happened to them. So these personalized trauma scripts and then giving propranolol and then seeing that there is, there is a reduction in at least the physiological responses. So the increase in heart rate and the increase in sort of skin conductance or sweating that you would get when people mm -hmm. normally are you know, recounting their trauma goes down when people have been given propranolol in conjunction with that reminder session. And, so, and that persists. And that seems to persist. So I think the most extensive follow-up actually has been done not for PTSD, but for phobia. So again, this was work done by Meryl Kint, and she was working with people who had spider phobia. Essentially, telling them that they were going to have to go and pick up a tarantula, and some sort of people were getting very anxious, sort of, on the verge of panic attacks, you know, doing this. But mm. just before they needed to do it, she would pull them out of the room. 
So that's actually quite an important part of the manipulation. There has to be some violation of expectation to get the memory to go into edit mode. So this expectation mm-hmm. that you're going to be forced to pick up a tarantula and then you're rescued from that is that violation of expectation that makes the memory unstable. She then gave propranolol or placebo and then assessed how people were with the tarantulas 24 hours later and then for months afterwards and got this amazing result that actually people who had the propranolol were quite happy to then go and pick up a tarantula and let it crawl up their arm and you know, it became, if anything, an approach response rather than an avoid response, which I'm, I'm not a great fan of spiders myself. I wouldn't characterize myself as a spider phobic, but I'm not a great mm. fan of spiders. I'm not sure you need a tarantula crawling up your arm. I think you know it's enough just to get them out in a glass and, and throw them out the window. But yeah, it, it was very persistent. She followed them up for at least a year after the manipulation and that was still there. So it does seem wow. to be long lasting. I have a friend who could use who could use that kind of treatment. Very afraid of spiders. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the chemical track, and then you mentioned that there is another mm-hmm. track. Yeah. So the other the other way of trying to do this in humans has been through behavioural approaches, based on the idea of the memory reconsolidation process being about memory updating. So mm-hmm. this is actually again work that came out of NYU. So Marie Monfi, mm-hmm. who's now based at the University of Texas at Austin essentially thought about this reconsolidation process as being about updating. And then reason that if that's the case, it should be possible while the memory is in that edit mode to overwrite what was there already. So what she's developed is this idea of essentially giving exposure therapy, which is you know currently available therapy for a number of mental health disorders. Mm. But to do that in combination with putting the memory back into a modifiable state, bringing it into edit mode. Mm. So what normally happens with exposure therapy is that people are, let's say, in the case of spider phobia, they're they're re-exposed to the spiders, often in this very kind of graded way. So a therapist will work with an individual, work out the hierarchy of least stressful to most stressful exposure. And somebody, the patient is taught coping strategies and stress management strategies so that they can gradually be re-exposed to this hierarchy. So it might be that there's you start off looking at a picture of a spider, you end up ultimately picking up a tarantula, but you work your way through this. And as you overcome each stage, you can then move on to the next stage. Now, in terms of what's happening with the memory in that case, you're not necessarily targeting the original memory. What you're forming is a new memory that tells you now that this cue is safe. So actually, a picture of a spider is safe. I can control that. I'm not afraid of that. So now I can you know, graduate, if you like, to being in the same room as a spider, but the spider is very far away. But you know what I'm going to work through? I will learn that is safe, and then you gradually work your way up. But that still mm. leaves the original memory in the brain intact. And Mm. that's potentially problematic because the extinction memory, the safety memory, tends to be quite context specific. So what you can find is that people, yeah, accept that the spider is safe, but it's safe while the therapist is there. But if the therapist goes away, Mm. that's that's no longer true. And the original memory comes back to dominate behavior. So it's a bit of a, a, a problem. So What Marie Monfils reasoned was, okay, can we take the memory while it's unstable and then do exposure therapy? And then rather than creating a new safety memory, we'd overwrite the original. So essentially Mm. what she does is, she did this in rodents, but Daniela Schiller, also at NYU, did this with human participants as well, who'd also undergone fear conditioning. So you re-expose your individual to the reminder. So there's this violation of expectations in the same sort of way you would do as if you were going to give propranolol as a treatment. But then you just take them out of the context for a few minutes. 10 to 15 minutes is enough. And then you do your exposure therapy. And what is a reduction in the fear memory that doesn't seem to come back when the context changes, it doesn't come back with time. It seems much more reliable and robust. Mm. 
And so mm. this kind of behavioral intervention is you know, potentially really powerful because it just involves a slight tweak actually to standard exposure therapy, but it has a huge potential impact on the efficacy of that therapy and the longevity of that therapy as well. So, you know, we talked about how we're going about changing memories and and what the benefits are and you know we we have to ask, we have to ask the the ethical the ethics question and we have to you know i i i know like you you've even planted i think clues in your in your ted talk about eternal sunshine of the spotless mind so clearly you're aware of that movie and it's clearly you've heard that that question a million times so instead of asking the obvious question i would like to ask you how could this go wrong this research the application research what could be some unintended consequences what should be what should we be careful about yeah, that's a really good question. So yeah, I, I love Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind. And I think it's a fantastic film. I suppose the, the yeah. thing to bear in mind is that these are, the memories that are being targeted with these kind of approaches are the emotional memories and not the event memories themselves. So certainly from Meryl Kint's work, mm. you know, with the, the undergraduates undergoing fear conditioning, the memory for the event itself remained intact. It was the fearful response that was affected. So quite often the ethical concerns about, you know, oh, you're, you know, we're going to wipe memories, we're going to undermine you know, what people remember and all sorts of atrocities could happen and no one would remember. And it, I, I think that's less of a concern because the event memories remain intact. So the, the purpose of these approaches is not to erase a memory of trauma, for example. It's to take somebody who's been through a traumatic event and developed PTSD and you know, take them and make them more like somebody who's been through a traumatic event and not developed PTSD. So you need that event memory to still be there, not right. least for courts and legal proceedings. To address your question of what could go wrong, I guess it comes down to, yeah, the over-application of these kinds of approaches. In Eternal Sunshine, they have it for the memory of losing you know, losing a pet or a breakup is obviously a, a big part of the story in that film. Although you wouldn't necessarily yeah. be losing the memory of the person in and of themselves. I would worry about the over-application of these kinds of approaches where the memories are not necessarily having such an impact on an individual that they can't live a normal functional life because the adaptive value of mm. bad events happening or even good events happening is that we learn from those experiences. And if you take away that learning opportunity, it will stop people from being able to change their behavior and to learn from these situations. So that I think would be... Mm the potential, you know, that's how it could go wrong. But we end up over pathologizing yeah. emotional learning experiences that are actually very adaptive, but falling back on you know, these kind of approaches to get rid of those emotional learning experiences. Because as much as we all hate the memory of the talk that went really badly wrong because you were underprepared or the joke that fell flat mm. and you felt very silly for having said it, those are learning experiences and we do change our behaviour moving forward. And that's an adaptive thing. That's what we do. You know, we learn, we change. Mm that's a really valuable part of experience. And I would hate to see that being over pathologized and targeted when it's, it's not necessary. And that would probably not be in our best interest to do so. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, it should be possible to let someone smell the, the smell of fresh baking bread, not give them the bread, but give them uh, propranolol instead. And suddenly potentially reduce the that wonderful anticipatory feeling right this is where i'm a little bit concerned it could someone do this to you against your will i guess would be my concern because if so they could start removing things that aren't that they don't serve you that you don't want to lose what if putin decides to take uh take a dissident's memory of how pleasant it was to be 
in a free country and what it, like the lovely experience of being free and being able to say everything you want. And that's an emotional memory. Or is there a way that a, a dictator or someone in power can really use this? Not, not to say that this is, this is a disqualifier because this, this is also a, a lot more wonderful stuff, but is there a way this can be mis- misused by someone in power, not too concerned about legality to start messing with our, well, who we are? So I think that question can be answered at a practical level and theoretical level, I think. Practically, I think it would be very difficult for something like that to happen because experience of living in a free country would involve a lot of different types of memory. And it's not just the emotional memory of that you know it's not just that we have a rewarding feeling for being in a free country but we can also reason as well that being in a free country was better because of very explicit reasons so I think that side Mm. of it reassures me that it would be very difficult practically to target all of those things in a way where somebody wasn't necessarily consciously aware of it or that couldn't be resisted in some way theoretically I think we don't know yet because the studies that have all been done on declarative memory of course have been done in humans where the same sort of approaches that you can take in animals are not necessarily possible theoretically I wouldn't want to rule it out but in practice you know we're we're a very long way from that so I think based on our current knowledge I think not too much of a concern theoretical knowledge that we might find in the future maybe that becomes more of a concern and it's always good Mm. to think about ethical implications early on before before it actually happens my gut feeling is that would still be that even theoretically my gut my intuition is that it would be very difficult to take something like you know, love of living in a free country and target that for disruption. Yeah, it's, it's for, for me, reading a lot of, about the advances in neuroscience in general just always feels like, oh, this is wonderful, but we need to take care of this dictatorship problem mm-hmm. because everything good that we do with the brain and everything we learn about the brain can lead into very dark places once the power structure is is not geared towards the welfare of the individual. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to get back to, you know, trauma a little bit and, and alternative ways of dealing with trauma. I, I know that research has shown that breath work and yoga and even psychedelics can really help deal with trauma. So h- how are these processes different or maybe the same but just different means of of getting at the same thing. How do you see the scope of this? Yeah, so I think there are some really interesting approaches that have been taken. Some of the sort of very mindful kind of breathing, but also exercise-based interventions as well, are probably still acting on the formation of that safety memory, that extinction learning but you can make it more powerful in in a number of ways. So there have been some really beautiful studies looking at virtual reality exposure rather than imagining trauma. This has been particularly looked at in um, Mm. combat veterans by people like Eric Vermetten. But it's also been found, for example, that moderate levels of exercise whilst doing therapy can enhance this safety learning as well. Walking on a treadmill and actually navigating through a virtual environment, actually quite often the way it's been done in these virtual reality environments is not with a headset, but in, they call it a cave, which is some clever acronym that I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but it's like a bit like Mm. an IMAX screen. So you're surrounded by this virtual reality exposure with the therapist next to the patient effectively walking with the patient Mm. through this environment while the patient is walking on a treadmill and the environment is moving around them and that seems to be really quite effective um, at enhancing the efficacy of exposure therapy so I think that's really interesting Mm. the psychedelic work I think is also very interesting it's something we're really 
intrigued by we haven't followed up on ourselves yet but I'm very interested in this so when I talked Mm. about the memory going into kind of edit mode I said there needed to be some kind of violation of expectations so there needs to be something a mismatch between Mm. what is expected and what actually occurs and the majority of the work in the reconsolidation literature has focused on the what actually occurs part of that basically the unexpected event that drives the memory into edit mode but there's another side of that that i think mm. has been somewhat neglected which is the expectation how what how is that expectation built and how fluid is that expectation because we know that it's not a, a linear relationship between the violation of expectation and the memory going into edit mode so if you deviate a little bit from what is expected you know if you don't deviate enough the memory won't go into edit mode if you deviate the right amount it will Mm. go into a state where it can be updated but if you go too far if you make the situation too different the original memory is unaffected Mm. and you just form a new memory instead so we know that there's a very subtle Mm. relationship between the violation of expectations and the memory actually becoming unstable. One idea yeah. for psych- how psychedelics might be working is that actually they are relaxing the expectations and making the expectations more fluid, more accommodating of the sensory information that is coming in. So we don't mm. yet know whether psychedelics are tapping into this same reconsolidation process but I would be really interested in knowing whether actually what psychedelics are doing is potentially allowing a greater range of sensory evidence to update the memory Mm. because the expectation is perhaps not so precisely defined under psychedelics that's relaxed which would then give you a greater scope for then putting the memory into an editable state yeah That's fascinating. Okay, so I have one final question, which is our standard closing question that our listeners already know very well. So in his TED Talk, the philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. A lecture being a dry, factual, hey, here's some facts, you make up your mind. And a sermon being a really urgent plea to change someone's life for the better, something that, you know, Taking, taking the other person really seriously and trying to shake them and, and, and change their life. Ellen de Botton says, we need more sermons. We need to bring back sermons. And so my question to you is, if you had a chance to give a short sermon to the world, something that could really change people's life, what would it be? What would it be? I think it would be about understanding we really make an effort to understand other people's lived experience because I think mental health disorders Mm. still get a lot of stigmatization compared to physical health disorders which we just seem to accept much more readily admitting to a mental health disorder is something that people often find quite hard especially if you think about disorders like addiction, where there are elements of blaming of the individual for having a disorder. So I think my sermon would be that all of these underlying mechanisms that give rise to mental health disorders are on a continuum. So we all have aspects of our personalities, our genetic makeup, that make us more or less susceptible to particular psychological, neurobiological processes going awry and to varying degrees. Mm. Depending on our life experiences, the chances that we've had, our early life experience, all of these factors in some individuals come together to mean that they go on to develop a mental health disorder. And I would really, if I could get one message across, I think it would be that we have to stop stigmatising the particular unfortunate combination of events and predispositions that have led to one person developing a mental health disorder and another person not. Because 
it could so mm. readily be any of us under any particular set of circumstances that appreciation kind of living and trying to experience life through somebody else's like somebody else's eyes somebody else's experience I think would go a long way to Mm. reducing that stigmatization which then might allow people to ask for help when they need it Mm. all right thank you Amy thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today Well, thank you for having me. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. Uh, We run design sprints all over the world, um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or uh, various organizations, through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake.